Hello, thanks for coming to today's video where we're going to be looking at drowning. So everybody knows what drowning is, but still we'll give it a definition. Uh, so in a nutshell, drowning is when there's uh, submersion or immersion uh, of an individual in liquid, um, which subsequently leads to some type of respiratory impairment. Um, so what is the difference between submersion and immersion? Well, submersion is when the entire body and head is underwater. Whereas immersion is only when the head is underwater. So, uh, you know, you can think of immersion as someone just putting their head in a bucket. Um, that would be immersion. So just a quick, uh, you know, technical uh, word there. So let's start with epidemiology. So who tends to, you know, most uh, commonly drown? Um, the first is going to be little children less than five years old. Mostly due to some type of neglect or, you know, low supervision. Um, you know, some kid is, you know, going around a pool and falls in and, you know, no one is watching and so, you know, they drown. So uh, that's going to be one, you know, common way there. Um, the other age group that's very commonly involved is the 15 to 25 year old age group. Um, not necessarily pools, but, uh, you know, rivers, uh, lakes and beaches. So, you know, some individual, you know, of an older age group uh, of this age group, 15 to 25, uh, you know, thinks that they can go ahead and, you know, swim or make it, you know, in the lake or want to go for some adventure uh, and they fall in or they, you know, jump in uh, and, and they can't do it. So then they end up drowning. So uh, that's kind of the common age group there. What are some risk factors? Um, the risk factors is, first of all, someone who has a low swimming ability. So someone who can't swim well, um, maybe gets overwhelmed by the situation that he finds himself in and so he ends up drowning not able to make it um, risky behavior uh, so you know people who you know maybe jump off cliffs or uh, into into large bodies of water they, they, or they swim too far out or for too long they tend to uh, you know drown uh, most often uh, people who have taken alcohol or other drugs um, it's very very common trauma so maybe someone got hit and fell into the water um, you know so that's one thing there Stroke or MI, so an individual or a patient can be uh, in the middle of swimming and then suddenly suffer from a stroke or myocardial infarction and so they're not able to uh, make it back to the actual shore. And finally seizure, so you know an individual who gets seizure in the middle of his swimming, again not able to control themselves and so they'll just uh, kind of succumb to the uh, water. So those are just uh, some of the epidemiological factors. Now let's talk about the pathophysiology, so what actually occurs to a patient as he's drowning. So we're going to look at that. Um, one of the first thing that occurs is, you know, obviously someone's, uh, you know, swimming or uh, doing what they're normally doing. Um, and then so when they start realizing that they're getting overwhelmed, one of the first thing that occurs, as you can probably expect, is they panic. Um, so in this panic, um, you know, they're trying to control their breathing rate uh, and, and stay above water. And so they basically, they lose the normal pattern of breathing. So the, they have loss of the normal breathing pattern which is important to uh, you know in order to maintain kind of the normal way that you breathe and so when when they have a loss of normal breathing pattern one of the things they do is they, do, they don't want to suck water in so what they end up doing is they just end up holding their breath um, so they, they end up holding their breath and then after a while you know you can't hold your breath forever so they'll suffer with something called air hunger so in air hunger the um, desire to breathe in become so overwhelming that they end up doing inspiration. So they end up actually inspiring. However, since they're underwater, they're not going to breathe in air. They're going to obviously going to breathe in water. And so they're going to aspirate. And when they aspirate, um, when, when an individual aspirates a large amount of water, there is a reflex laryngeal spasm because your body does not, your, your lungs do not want that water to get in. So uh, it kind of agitates the larynx and then it, it closes up. And obviously this is going to lead to hypoxemia so that's just a quick you know within the first uh, few minutes of actual you know aspiration that's what occurs now if you look at the text they they do separate different types of water so um, one type of water is going to be salt water that someone can aspirate and then the other type of water can be is fresh water so the difference between these two is obviously the um, you know osmolality so obviously salt water has more electrolytes and fresh water has less electrolytes than water. So just to kind of um, illustrate the point, um, here we have your alveoli, um, there's your um, pulmonary veins, and you know, the vessel capillaries actually, and there is water, salt water. So in this situation, this right here is salt water. 
So you have a high electrolyte concentration here compared to what's in the vessel. So what would you expect to occur? Well, obviously the water will rush from the vessels into the actual uh, alveoli and then the amount of um, water in the actual alveoli is going to increase. So this is all because salt water has more electrolytes than the actual body. Now what happens in fresh water? So we'll just actually draw the same lung here. So there we have your uh, alveoli, this is your you know, pulmonary capillaries, and then we have some uh, fresh water here. So in this situation, we have more electrolytes here than here. So which way is the water you know, going to go? Well, obviously, it'll tend to go out that way. So overall, in, fre in fresh water, um, you know, the, the, there will be more water in the intravascular area, whereas in salt water, there will be more water in the actual alveoli. So what does that mean? Well, in salt water, the patient tends to get pulmonary edema, whereas in fresh water, the patient tends to get hemodilution. Uh, and this hemodilution, you know, theoretically, if it's large enough, it can actually, you know, m mess with the electrolyte um, levels. So now, theoretically, these are, you know, they make a lot of sense and, um, you know, I guess it's mentioned. However, in, in practical world, these are not that important. And the reason is, is because it's very difficult to aspirate enough water to actually lead to these types of effects. I mean, when you aspirate, you only aspirate about three to four milliliters per kilogram. And that's, again, because of this reflex laryngeal spasm which doesn't want any more um, you know, fluid to come into the lungs. So keep that in mind. So just remember that you, there is not enough water aspirated to actually cause any hemodilution and, and affect the electrolyte levels. Um, so where does most of the water go? I mean, per, the person opening their mouth. Well, most of the water ends up in the stomach. So um, a lot of the water is swallowed. And this is important because later they can actually vomit the water out and aspirate it later. So that's something to keep in mind uh, when you're managing these patients in the future. So um, <clears throat> let's get into the actual effects on the, on the lung. So what are the pulmonary effects? Well, when, when the water goes into the actual lungs, um, it, it begins to have something what's called a washout effect. And so what it does is all the surfactant gets washed out of the lungs. Now, if you go back to your you know, path, path of physio uh, the physiology of the lungs, surfactant allows the uh, prevents the alveoli from collapsing and so if you wash out all the surfactant you end up getting atelectasis and atelectasis just means the lungs the alveoli collapse and if so the alveoli collapse obviously air can't get into it so you get um, ventilation perfusion mismatch or also known as vq vq mismatch and so you get shunting of blood so blood will come to the actual lungs however no air will come and so the, the blood will just uh, go through the lungs without getting oxygenated. And eventually this will lead to uh, hypoxemia, uh, which obviously has effects throughout the whole body. Now on auscultation, um, you will get, um, wait, no, okay. Uh, you'll get wheeze and crackles. So that's what you feel on auscultation. And obviously the patient will be shortness of breath because you know their lung is full of water. So you'd expect that. Um, what other effects would you have on the body? Well, they're all neurological effects. And this is due to the fact that um, there's hypoxemia. So there's just not enough oxygen in the blood and the, you know, the brain needs a lot of oxygen to, to, be, to maintain. So that's one of the first organs affected. And this hypoxemia will eventually lead to ischemia of the brain. And this ischemia will obviously lead to neuronal damage. Um, what also can occur um, is you can get cerebral edema. So the brain will you know, pretty much swell up and that can increase the intracranial pressure. So high ICP is very common in uh, drowning victims. Um, on the heart, um, you do tend to get some arrhythmias. Um, this could be you know, sinus related such as tachycardia, bradycardia, <coughs> or it can also affect the um, atrium and lead to atrial fibrillation. And um, the final organ, a very, very important organ, is going to be the renal, or the renal system. And again, you, in, in the renal uh, organ, you can get the uh, acute tuber necrosis. And this is, again, due to hypoxemia. And evidence of that would either be you know, hemoglobinuria or even myoglobinuria. So those are the two things you're you know, watching out for in uh, uh, drowning victims. So that is the pathophysiology. So what we'll do now is we'll um, 
Actually, I did forget to mention one thing. Um, although salt water and fresh water we mentioned is not so important, um, what is important is dirty water. And the reason why dirty water is important because if someone drowns in dirty water, what they can also aspirate is bacteria. And so if they aspirate bacteria, they can also get pneumonia because of um, bacterial uh, aspiration. Not only that, but let's just say there's mud and other you know particulates in the water that can end up plugging the um, lungs. So particulates can end up plugging. So that's uh, although maybe being salt water, fresh water is not important. Dirty water can be uh, an important factor. So just want to mention that real quickly before we talk about the management. So management, there's uh, two stages. First is going to be the acute stage or the, the pre-hospital stage. So what you do with a patient um, or an individual who just just came out of the water and is in front of you, what would you do? Well, the first thing you do is you, you initiate CPR um, and you know you try to maintain ventilation as much as possible. Um, if you know if an ambulance comes, um, you know you probably want to give uh, supplemental oxygen or if you have you know, that available for some reason, you can try to give supplemental oxygen. And um, intubation is sometimes necessary if the patient is apneic. So uh, these are your three type of things here. The first one here, CPR methylation, obviously you can do as an individual. However, uh, supplemental oxygen and intubation will probably be something that would happen in the ambulance. Um, so in the emergency room, what will you be doing? So emergency room management, um, we would follow the ABCD, which is, um, which if you don't know, um, A stands for airway, B stands for breathing, C stands for uh, circulation, D stands for disability, and E stands for exposure. So um, this is with any, you know, ER, that's what you always do, any patient, first check airway. So um, for airway, you might want to consider possibly uh, intubating. So obviously if the airway is patent, you won't do anything, but if you do want to consider intubation if they show neurological symptoms, because that's a pretty poor prognosis, prognostic sign. And if you do the arterial blood glass, if the um, arterial oxygen, the pressure of arterial oxygen is less than 60, or if the CO2 is greater than 50, you want to definitely intubate, because that's just telling you that the respiratory effort is not, uh, not enough. Um, now, for that's A for airway. B for breathing. Um, you want to give them supplemental oxygen, uh, and your goal in giving them supplemental oxygen is to maintain the uh, oxygen saturation above 94%. And this oftentimes is given through a CPAP, so that's uh, how we do that. For circulation, um, you want to monitor that. Um, circu circulatory system isn't always uh, affected unless there's some type of arrhythmia, but well, this is primarily respiratory you know, uh, circulation. But you do want to monitor the blood pressure. You want to monitor the pulse. Um, you can get cardiac telemetry as well. And at the same time, you can check the oxygen saturation and even the end tidal uh, carbon dioxide. So that's what you want to do as far as uh, monitoring those. Next, uh, with D, with disabilities, um, neurological disabilities, what you're really worried about, um, because that is a prognostic factor. Um, so, you know, uh, glossal coma scale, um, generally elevate the head because remember they do have cerebral edema, so you want to try to decrease the ICP as much as possible. And diuretic is sometimes used if you do, if they do have the ICP, but you want to kind of balance that because they might be actually dehydrated, especially if it was in that, you know, fresh water um, drowning and if the patient does get a seizure um, make sure to give a non-sedative uh, anticonvulsant so that's something to keep in mind as well um, next we have um, exposure so you want to remove all the wet clothes and you want to rewarm the patient um, and this is important because oftentimes water is cold so they're suffering from hypothermia so why is hypothermia bad and of course some people say you know if someone drowns in really cold water that lowers the actual energy needs of the body so they can they can live longer. And that might be true, but um, after they're better or after they're out of the water, uh, it's actually gonna hurt more. And this is because oftentimes they get severe vasoconstriction uh, and this sends you know the kidneys the idea to you know start urinating more because it kind of thinks that there's hypertension going on. And so once you you know the patient urinates more, they become hypovolemic and hypovolemic they become hypotensive. And so that's, of course, very, very dangerous. So you do want to make sure you rewarm the patients uh, internally and externally. So externally, just put some blankets or something on them, and internally, you can use uh, warm saline IV. Um, so that's the management there. Um, let's talk about prognosis. 
Um, there are some poor prognostic factors that we can go over. Um, the first one is the actual length that they were submerged. So if they were submerged uh, for more than 25 minutes, that's pretty poor prognostic sign. Uh, the second one that we can look at is how quickly they received treatment. So if resuscitation uh, took more than 25 minutes, that's another poor prognostic sign. Age is a factor. Um, little kids tend to do better. So if they're less than 14, they actually do better. And they think this is just because uh, their body is able to just react much more stronger and kind of adapt a little bit better. So um, younger kids tend to do better. Um, glossocoma scare of less than 5 is a um, pretty bad sign. Um, apnea and a pH of less than 7.1 are other poor prognostic factors. So this pretty much wraps up the discussion about um, drowning. So I hope you guys found it beneficial and I will see you guys in a future video. Thank you.